Okay, we are live. Sergeants, we begin the recording. Computer recording is up. According to the cloud is up. Sergeant Belando, you may begin with the opening. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Criminal Justice. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, you may do so via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you. For your cooperation, Chair Powers, we are ready to begin. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. I am City Council Member Keith Powers. I'm the Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee here in the City Council, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today for our hearing on the update to the Local Conditional Release Commission. In May of 2020, during the very early days of COVID-19 here in New York City and the pandemic, the City Council passed my bill, now Local Law 60 of 2020, to create a local conditional release commission. This commission would decide which city sentence individuals may be released and under what conditions. Uh, this is actually stems from New York State law, which allows us to have the opportunity to create a local release commission and uh, also requires under that that the mayor appoint at least five members with consent of the City Council. Uh, the commissioner of probation or her designee must serve as a non-voting member and the department of probation is required or uh, uh, mandated with staffing that commission. When the council adopted a city budget this past June, we had directed over $400,000 to the department of probation to help fund the commission. Yet we're here 16 months later and that commission is still not up and running. Uh, as anybody who's paying attention to the news here over the last few months and last year, the current crisis in our jails underscores the need for this commission. And without question, part of the strategy here has been to lower the population inside of our city jails as we get a handle on the COVID crisis, the staffing crisis, and other things happening inside of our city jails right now. The, uh, in the most recent status report to the court, the federal monitor, the news and dentist monitor, noted the use of force remain, remains extremely high. Stabbings and slashing increased this month. And there is a continued failure to use basic security protocols, such as locking doors, intervening in silent violence and self-harm, and properly using restraints. Since our last hearing, four more people have died in custody, a total of 14 custody in custody deaths this year. And it is our, we send our deepest condolences to every family and friend uh, of those folks. And obviously here have an obligation to make sure that there are not any more deaths inside of our custody. And that means we have to utilize every option at our disposal to lower the population inside the city jails. Each person we safely release means one less per person's life is at risk for self-harm, suicide, assault, and neglect. And we are here today to find an update on what the commission's staffing and role and setup is, to we urge administration to move quickly, to staff and establish that. And we have a number of questions today and when can we expect it to be fully staffed? How soon can they convene? And how many el eligible folks do they anticipate would be in the conversation or eligible for release once the commission begins its work? I just want to reiterate one more time. We are in a crisis inside of our city jails right now. And even as we make moves to uh, solve the staffing issues and open up new housing units and uh, do a lot of other work. There's still a lot of questions here about how we safely manage the population, and we are trying to give the tools here to help do that. And of course, are disappointed when those tools aren't being fully utilized. So again, we'll urge the administration here today to give us updates and move quickly on this to address what is a crisis. Uh, before I move forward, I just want to note a, a few colleagues who are here. I see Councilmember Darma Diaz, Councilmember Riley, Councilmember Van Bramer, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, and I believe we'll be joined by many more this afternoon or this morning, rather. I want to uh, thank uh, the staff here at the City Council, uh, to Agatha, Keyshawn, and Jack, and Mike staff, Kate and Kay. Uh, I also 
Uh, I want to thank uh, who's on his way out, Brian Crow here from the city council and just say a very big thank you to Brian who is leaving us in the council to go work for the Manhattan District Attorney, but has been an absolutely fantastic staffer and resource here at the city council. And Brian will be working with you uh, over the next few years on many of these issues, but of course we'll still be uh, uh, sad that you're walking down the street to go work somewhere else. But with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to committee council to take care of some procedural items and then we'll start here for the administration. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Agatha Mavropoulos, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Criminal Justice. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn to testify, you will receive a prompt to unmute. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. We will first hear testimony from the Department of Probation, followed by a period of question and answer from committee members to the administration. We will then hear from the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Committee members will be limited to two minutes, including responses. I will now administer the oath to all members of the administration. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Anna Bermudez. Did you hear me? Did I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Executive Agency Counsel and Director of the Local Conditional Release Commission, Roberto Velez. I do. Thank you. And General Counsel Wayne McKenzie. Now, I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from the administration, starting with Commissioner Bermudez, followed by Director Velez. Commissioner Bermudez, you may begin when ready. And Thank just you. before, sorry, hey, Commissioner, sorry, but just before we start, I just want to acknowledge, and I'm sorry if I missed them before, we've been joined by Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Holden as well. And of course, I'll acknowledge anyone else as they show up. So sorry about that, but you can no, proceed. No problem. Um, thank you all. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Criminal Justice Committee. I'm Ana Bermudez, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation. Uh, with me today, as you know, um, is General Counsel Wayne McKenzie, and I'm also pleased to introduce Roberto Velez, who's our newly hired Executive Agency Counsel and the Director of the New York City Conditional Release Commission. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the important work of the Department of Probation and to update you on the status of the Conditional Release Commission. Our Commission Director, uh, who you will hear from shortly, He's only finishing up his second week in his new role, uh, but fortunately for us, Mr. Velez is no stranger to the DOP family, having previously worked at our agency and in city government in a variety of capacities. This will serve him well as he builds upon the ongoing work undertaken at DOP since the council passed local law number 60, reconstituting the commission. As you already know from our work on the enabling legislation, there have been other release mechanisms employed recently with the goal of short-term emergency management of the city's jail population, which like you, Chair Powers, we share um, our condolences with two families that um, of folks who've, who've died in, uh, in custody. Um, the New York City CRC differs from those other release types though in three areas, eligibility, longevity, and model. First, the pool of um, those eligible for this particular conditional release is limited only to those individuals who have been convicted of certain crimes and are also serving sentences of 120 days or more. Roughly over 100 people, according to the daily jail, jail, daily jail census. Um, however, as the process unfolds and we have more outreach and partnership with other parts of the justice system, we, we'll, we would be looking at potentially hundreds of eligible people over the course of a year. Um, now, second, by reconstituting the LCRC, the council has provided um, more than simply another temporary release method, but one that is far more institutionalized and lasting, even after this pandemic is over. Um, lastly, and most significantly, this model is unique. An independent commission of qualified individuals vetted and chosen with advice of the council 
will review and ultimately approve any applicants for release. And as you mentioned before, as commissioner of DOP, I will be an ex officio, a non-voting member of this commission. Uh, probation then utilizes our expertise in balancing structure and support according to the person's specific risks and needs to safely supervise the approved applicants in their communities for one year. A key advantage of the CRC model is that all components of the process would be housed under one roof within probation, ensuring both a consistent programmatic ethos and seamless integration across the conditional release continuum from application through community supervision. As you know, probation is the largest alternative to incarceration option in New York City and plays a crucial role in keeping us all safe. At DOP, we understand that safety is more than just the absence of crime, but the network of trusted relationships focused on a person's well being and the well being of their community. This has never been more important, and I'm very proud of this agency's ability to continually adapt to the needs of the people we serve. During the pandemic, we pivoted to provide critical resources to communities hardest hit by COVID-19, which includes those served by our Neighborhood Opportunity Network, better known as NEON, um, feeding close to half a million people through our NEON Nutrition Kitchens, launching new virtual summer programming for 2,700 youth, and continuing our, offer, our other offerings online. I am also thrilled to announce that our wonderful NEON Photography Program currently has its first post-pandemic in-person exhibit happening at the Kente Royal Gallery in Harlem. Of course, this does not include the permanent gallery at Council Member Holden's office, which has featured the work from our neon photographers for years. The pieces being featured are all from the Harlem Summer 2021 class, which was taught by a neon photography graduate and fellow community resident. The gallery owner was so compelled when he learned of the program that he agreed to host this exhibit, which runs through this weekend. And one of our photographers was brought to tears from the amount of pride and joy she felt seeing her work featured in the New York City Gallery. So I encourage you all to see it if possible. As people on probation are currently successfully completing their sentence at a rate of nine out of 10, I am confident that this combined approach allows for both the safety of those being released as well as the New York City communities they call home. Thank you council members for the confidence in probation you have shown by reestablishing the conditional release initiative. I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have in just a moment, but before that, I would like to provide Roberto Velez, Executive Agency Counsel and Director of the New York City Conditional Release Commission, an opportunity to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Criminal Justice Committee. My name is Roberto Velez, Agency Executive Counsel and Director of the New York City Conditional Release Commission. As this is only my uh, second week in the role, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself to you, share my background, and tell you why I'm thrilled to return to probation and oversee the work of the New York City's Conditional Release Commission. I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised in the Bronx. For 31 years, I've worked as an attorney representing and helping the people of the city of New York. For 17 of those years, I worked in city government under three different mayoral administrations. Koch, Giuliani, and Bloomberg. I've held a variety of city government positions, including the Chief Judge of the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, better known as OATH. OATH is a city's independent tribunal with a reputation of providing excellent and well-reasoned decisions. As Chief Judge, I was responsible for the successful merger of numerous city tribunals into OATH. The largest merger involved the Environmental Control Board, better known as ECB which created one of the largest and in my opinion, best run independent tribunals in the country. I've held a variety of other high level city positions such as chief of staff and associate commissioner at the Department of Juvenile Justice and Department of Consumer Affairs respectively. And I had the honor of serving as commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation during September 11th and its aftermath. It was a difficult time for us all and despite that, the staff of DOP continued to do an outstanding job supervising and helping people on probation. I've served as an attorney in private practice and a partner in Anderson Kill, where I specialize in protecting policyholder rights, and more recently at Gonzalez Overlander, where I worked on litigation and transactional matters. I'm particularly proud of my work at GO, defending and assisting members of the union Local 32BJ with their legal matters including matrimonial and family court issues. It was especially satisfying to assist 32 member, uh, BJ members whose primary language was Spanish 
and help them resolve a range of issues for, for which they otherwise may have had difficulty gaining effective representation. I've also worked in the not-for-profit arena where I served as general counsel for Acacia Network from 2010 to 2014. In that capacity, I served as a principal legal advisor to the chief executive officer and his executive team. I was responsible for developing and implementing Acacia's new corporate compliance and risk management programs. I'm very excited to return to probation. I'm passionate about helping people find their way out of the criminal justice system by effectively navigating and accessing city government programs, services, and resources. I'm especially excited to help create and oversee an initiative that will assist people who are incarcerated return to their families and communities sooner and begin what the, my probation colleagues call their new now. Thank you again, council members, for the opportunity to testify and introduce myself today. I look forward to working with you on this important commission. And with that, I defer back to com the commissioner. Thank you, Director Velez. Um, so while this concludes the CRC part of our testimony, I would like to take a moment to personally and deeply thank all of you and the council as a whole for the incredible partnership we have built over the last four years. Um, you have been tireless champions of the work of this department from keeping us accountable in oversight hearings, amplifying the strong evidence from our arches and aim evaluations, holding the groundbreaking neon arts hearing where the incredible people we serve showed you how the arts have changed their lives and providing the funding needed to support those impactful initiatives. It is through your support and the work of the incredible probation staff that we have been able to accomplish outcomes that I'm not only extremely proud of, but that years ago, I could not have imagined were possible. When I first started as commissioner, like six out of 10 people were completing probation. Now it's nine out of 10. In addition, we've also seen a 33% increase in the rate at which people on probation earn an early discharge. The people on probation who live in neighborhoods with a neon, who are the vast majority of whom are people of color, are also, which is incredible, successfully completing at a rate of nine to 10. So the barriers, the longstanding structural barriers in these neighborhoods are no longer there when it comes to probation um, and, and justice outcomes. Um, and that's a true testament to the strength of the neon model, the people we serve and their communities. And now justice system outcomes need not be predetermined by a person's zip code. All of this is how we ensure public safety and create a more just New York City with vastly improved outcomes for people on probation and their communities at roughly a hundred times less per capita than the cost of incarceration. I thank you again for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you to, to both of you and uh, to Mr. Velez. I think you're just said you're on for the last two weeks. So uh, welcome and congratulations uh, to you. Um, well, look, I think we are here for a very clear to get a status update on the uh, commission and its appointees. And certainly I think uh, uh, we're happy that there's a new, a new director here. Um, but I think, you know, only two weeks ago was the appointed. So um, I, I think it would be important for us to get a better feel and handle on where the city is and, and in terms of uh, uh, staffing and, and uh, appointing folks. So I guess my, my starting point is how, how many the, the state law allows uh, the uh, requires the release commission to have at least five members. Can you give us two, two questions there? One is, we'll, can you give us a sense of how many individuals will be serving on the commission and second how many have been appointed so far so that's the part of the statute that is not under the purview of the department so that's what we've focused um uh on making sure that we're ready to go when the commission gets um constituted and so that with the director in place now we've been working on our internal protocols and initial um documents for the commission once it's constituted to to essentially run with it um and so that's the part that we have control over and that that is already in place um the other part so how, many, how many individuals have been so mr velez you're you're the you're being running and how many members have been appointed so far well that's the thing yeah, yeah. he I'll defer to the commission yeah he he doesn't have that 
authority either. It's it's via. But, the- but but you guys have information certainly, right? So no, are you saying nobody knows how many members have been appointed so far? So I am not uh, clear on that. No. Yeah, um, what we can say is that uh, um, to our knowledge, no one has been appointed at this time. Um, What we've been focusing on and what we're in a position to do is once those members are appointed, we're ready to go. Um, I would anticipate that obviously we need at least five commissioners. So I would be comfortable saying five commissioners plus our commissioner. who's a, a member of this commission ex officio. So that's about the only thing that we would be confident saying right now. Okay, and then Mr. McKenzie, you said you don't believe anybody has been um, appointed to date, is that correct? Well, uh, I think you would actually know before me because mm-hmm. once the names are submitted to the council, it's the council who officially um, appoints the members of, of the commission. We have not ever vetted, I don't, I don't believe we've ever seen a member of this commission come before the city council. Um, and Commissioner Bermudez, is that, does that, uh, 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 are you aware of anybody who's been appointed yet at this point in time? No, I'm not. Okay. And like like uh, uh, Mr. McKenzie said, um, you know, this is, it, it's a process that goes through the Office of Appointments with the council. And so we, have, we do not know. I know, but I, I'm just being fair. Like, I don't want us to be too cute here today in the hearing. I think everybody knows that there's been nobody appointed. I, I know that there's different agencies here, but certainly the mayor's office and, and the folks here have, I'm sure, briefed for this, you know, hearing today. We have mayor staff, I'm sure, who are watching right now. I, I think I, we understand there's the Office of Appointments and there's different agencies, but I guess maybe can, one of you can share with us what the... Uh, what is you know the current vetting process or that uh, uh, is, going, is is being undertaken to identify and appoint members? So I mean, when the law passed, you know, I know we submitted some suggestions, as you know, because we sent you a le- uh, that list. Um, and my understanding is that it's been progressing. I don't know where it stands right now um it as to individual people i wish i, I wish hear I from the mayor's office of appointments or or the mayor's office that can uh, uh get onto the zoom and testify to answer these questions because i understand that this isn't entirely in your purview but you are the ones who were sent here to to talk about it and certainly i think it was clear we weren't just here to talk about the uh, process ahead. We wanted to get a status update on it. Is there somebody from the mayor's office who can testify then in, in, about the status update? There um, no- obviously, it's the, the, three, the three of us. We came here prepared to um, confirm to this committee and to the council that in terms of the work that we are statutorily charged with, we are prepared to go. Um, As the commissioner just said, there were some names that that we submitted. Um, It's our understanding that individuals have been contacted, but where that process is, is something that clearly um, we're not involved with. Okay. You might imagine my confusion here to be here at a hearing today and not have anyone to be able to talk about that process. So can you tell us what the vetting process is for an individual that uh, is going through that process and how long it will take to vet a candidate uh, uh, based on any understanding of that process? Um, I, well, I can't comment on uh, how long <laughs> it will take. There are there's statutorily required um, uh, qualifications that the people need to have including, you know, accredited bachelor's degree uh, or five years experience in the in the um, fields of either criminology, you know, social work, uh, psychiatry, etc. 
they need to be New York City residents um, and uh, not have any uh, conflicts of interest that a public officer um, uh, would have, for example, a membership, um, uh, you know, membership in political organizations, things like that. Um, and so that's generally the scope of the, of the qualifications. Um, and then how long that takes, I, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on. Um, can you talk to us about the process the city's been, can you give us some information on the process that the city has undertaken so far to recruit individuals to be on it? What sort of outreach they've done uh, to date to identify individuals and uh, when the city started its efforts to recruit individuals to serve on the commission? I, I really cannot, I do not know. Chair Powers, I wish I did. Um, I just know that I know there's candidates out there <laughs> um, for sure, but uh, uh, but I can't comment on any of the specifics at this point. Um, right. I mean, we submitted a, a list of names, but of course we would have absolutely no idea um, if the mayor's office of appointments have, have um, gotten other candidates submitted from other sources. Uh, right. So we would be naturally ignorant about that. Yeah, I, I think maybe there should be somebody from that office, the mayor's office here to speak to those issues. I'm not trying to take these all out on you, know, but I think the administration is watching this and clearly knows that they did not send us to everyone here to be able to answer questions about it. I'm gonna take a quick pause uh, here. I'm gonna let uh, Council Member Vera and, and any other council members jump in and ask questions if, if they would like to hop in here. And then I have a couple more that I'll get back to. So I'll go to Councilmember Rivera uh, uh, for now, and then any other colleagues that want to ask a question. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Just a quick follow up on one of Councilmember Powers' question. He asked about the the vetting process. Did, did you say how many people the city's vetted to serve on the commission? No, I don't, I don't know how many they have. I, right. I provided a list, um, you know, early on. And my understanding, what I, the, the, the extent of what I know is that they're going through the vetting process of, of lists of candidates that may be ours or others as well. No, I know, I know he did ask about it. I just wanted to know if, if someone had come up with a number. Okay, how is the city recruiting candidates to serve on the commission? Um, well, like I said, you know, certainly we, we su supplied some, some options, but I believe the Office of Appointments has also sought other, um, is probably seeking other uh, viable candidates. Oh, I'm sorry? That the, that the, off I don't believe that the Office of Appointments is limited to only the list that we've provided that they're seeking they're probably be seeking other viable candidates from other sources as well and i guess my follow-up question specifically on that is how are you working to prioritize the inclusion of commission members with lived experience with the criminal justice system? That um, several of the candidates we, we uh, suggested in our original list have that lived experience, yes. Absolutely. And I would say yeah. that's, that's actually um, was a priority and a concern for us to ensure um, that there was a diverse representation, including um, potential candidates with that lived experience. So you're, how are you kind of going about, and I realize my time is up. I was just looking for a few details as to, as to how you you're- can keep, You can keep going. Keep so, going. so as part of the list that we submitted, there were more than one, there were a number of candidates that um, had the experience to which you were alluding. And then in, in, the, in the vetting process that way, it was not just one person so that if that person didn't work out, there wouldn't be other options, right? So, so that's, that was part of the, 
the, the goal is to make sure that we had at least one commission member uh, out of the five who, who had a lived experience. Right. So my, I guess my specific question is absolutely that that should be a priority. Are, how are you going about it being intentional? Are you recruiting in certain places? Are you utilizing certain networks? And, and that's just the, the last follow up I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the time. Um, so since I was actually part of that process, I, I can speak to that. Um, between myself and all the members of our staff, we, we have uh, a vast network of um, criminal justice contacts throughout the city. And so we specifically sought out individuals who would meet all of the qualifications and were formerly um, justice involved. So we were very intentional about that and made sure that we submitted, um, I think it was maybe about three or, or, yeah, approximately three individuals who met that qualification. All right, I'm just gonna say that I share council member powers concerns here that we all need a lot more information because uh, lives are quite literally at stake. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have council member Holden up next. Time starts now. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Commissioner. Nice to see you again. And uh, I'm going to talk about my favorite subject, uh, neon arts. Uh, the neon arts, I, I think, um, by the way, I, I just want to show you, uh, this is uh, one of the, oh, one of the uh, I don't know if you can see it with the glare here. I but, know, I know exactly uh, the picture, the, the photograph it is, is one of my favorites too. Right. And, and um, teaching college for 44 years and teaching in the area of photography and, and graphic design. Uh, I must say that the, the, the talent in the neon arts uh, matches that and matches and even in some cases goes beyond. So, um, and by the way, just a disclaimer, we just had to take the show down, the neon arts show, because we got hit with flooding from our, our roof uh, and we had to take all the art down uh, from the wall because we didn't want to get it damaged so it's stored until we're you know working on the office until we finish painting and so forth but uh, it'll be back <laughs> but uh and and i you know again i would like even new work um if if we could uh, arrange that but uh coming from that's why I, I have my you know the office it looks like a gallery and this is what you know coming from the arts i think it's so important um to give people um, a goal in life, a purpose, to feel that they're needed, and to feel that they have something to offer. And in, in probation, that's that's vital. And that's why I want to ask you if how we can, you know, what are the, some of the steps we can do to expand this program uh, to the point where it's helping more people? And, and how, can you elaborate just like how many how many people um, really is are in the neon arts program? So um, I, there's been a, a vast number of people in the neon arts program, and I, I want to tie it to the work of the CRC because people coming out of Rikers um, um. through the process of the release commission, um, you know, will will be part of, will be able to participate in all of the neon programming that we have, and that's what makes it so robust also, um, you know, for, for this population that usually gets out of uh, jail with nothing, you know, really. Um, and so I believe it's in the, in the vicinity of 250 people in neon photography right now. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, on the wait list, sorry. I was, I, because I don't have the full numbers of the, of the, um, with me, uh, of the participation in neon uh, photography, but there's a, pretty extensive wait list at the moment. Um, I, we would love to engage with you about expanding that. Um, I don't have a particular, um, a particular path to that uh, to suggest right now, but we are definitely interested in uh, pursuing that. Yeah, but uh, Commissioner, let's meet. I'm sorry, uh, Chair, I know my time is up, but uh, I just want to, um, I'd like to be involved in, in trying to expand the program because okay. I do have some experience teaching 44 years and launching careers and encouraging um, young people uh, to go into the arts and and to and to really 
you know, identify their talents because there's different talents, not only photography and design, um, in poetry and in, in painting. There's there's so many areas we could and and that, uh, you know, this is the truth that if like I said, if you if you work one on one with individuals and counsel them and you know um, they get to know you, uh, you can do wonders. And uh, it's so important to have one on one. So. We need, um, not only do we need some more counselors, obviously, and more people to um, uh, work with, uh, you know, uh, these individuals that uh, uh, really need a purpose in life and need a, need a direction. And um, it can be done very easily if, if somebody just takes the necessary steps to do that. And uh, that's where we put, should put our money into the budget um, to turn around lives. So thank you, Commissioner. And again, I'm sorry, Chair, it took, uh, it took so long, but it's a... Uh, I'm very passionate about right. the program. It's, it's right. vital. Thank you. I appreciate it and appreciate your passion for a program that's doing great work, and including in my district at Carnegie Hall as well. Um, I, I don't see other member questions. I'm just going to go back to some questions I had. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for Mr. Velez, I suppose we don't know the answer until we have appointments, but when, when do you expect or anticipate that you would, or when would you like the commission to convene its work? As the commissioner said, um, we here internally at probation are ready. Um, once again, um, we're waiting for our commissioners, but the systems here at probation, we could begin tomorrow. Okay. Um, the fiscal 2022 executive plan included $450,000 and a head count of four staff for the commission for the next fiscal year. Uh, I, I guess one is, have you filled any positions beyond your uh, a title at this point. Um, can you tell us what the other titles and functions are for each of these positions and uh, which positions remain vacant? Um, like the commissioner said, my second week here, I'm not aware of all the different positions available. So I'm going to ask the commissioner to, to help me with that, what positions are available at this point. Well, so, you know, I, I can oh, go ahead. Jump in. Um, the, the next hire for example, that we're contemplating. We wanted to wait until our director was, was on board so um, he can have a voice and, and role in constituting um, his staff. So the next person would be an administrative um, assistant. Other than that, in terms of what we would need to run the commission, um, those individuals are already in place here. Now, as the process develops, obviously I think we're going to require more staffing, but right now we have what we need to begin. And is, is where is the LCRC uh, expected to operate out of? Is it at the Department of Probation? Uh, offices or has the city provided office space at this point? Yeah, so um, in this ver in this world of COVID right now, we're, you know, it's, it's uh, will fluctuate, it may be fluid because it may may need to be somewhat virtual at some points. And so those are all the things that are, will be worked out directly with the, when the commission is constituted. Um, but for now we have space here that can be dedicated to that um, and keep it separate and apart from the, 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 the work of the department itself. And just to go back to a question that you mentioned earlier, because I you did at one point, I believe, identify, I think I, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it was three individuals that could potentially be candidates for the commission uh, some time ago, I believe in a letter uh, to my office, maybe to the mayor's office as well, you had sent over some names. Did those individuals, do you know, do you have any understanding whether those individuals went through the vetting process at the mayor's office of appointments? Um, I believe they're, they've been going through the list. So um, as part of the, the, the entire process. So um, I don't have any specifics of, of those individuals. But it's your understanding that they may have looked at those individuals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the budget for the commission is supported by federal funding, as I understand it, not city tax, so I believe, for the next three fiscal years, including the one we're in right now. 
Um, can you tell us what is the source of the federal funding for the commission? And it, obviously there's a concern that that wouldn't be a sustainable source of funding in the future. So can you tell us how it expects to be funded in the uh, future years? In the out years? Um, yeah. I, I'm actually not, um, uh, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, so if um, I get back to you, if I can get back to the council on that, that would be uh because we know we have the funding it's been put in you know the the dollar amount that you spoke about is in our budget um and so we have to um look into the future years uh or i'll try to get the answer for you before we can be uh um finish today um it, 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 as some folks may know this there was a local commission release commission uh, some years ago, and then and, and, and there was a department investigation report uh, back in 2004 that issued a number of recommendations to make it more transparent. Um, can you tell us what the status is of developing operational procedures for convening meetings, taking written minutes, documenting refusals, uh, and other processes that the DOI had recommended? So we, <laughs> that's one thing we definitely did is... Uh, pour through that, that report, uh, make sure that mis the mistakes were not replicated. Um, ultimately, the decision about the, the, the procedures will be the commissions, but what we have done to try to jumpstart the process is to have some preliminary you know, suggestions and drafts um, so that the commission can then make their final determinations as to what, that, what they're gonna follow, uh, but uh, Director Velez was provided with that with that report. Uh, we're, we've poured all over it to ensure that those uh, mistakes don't happen again. And and again, um, our emphasis was on um, structure and transparency. Yeah. And documenting decisions that the um, commission made. And if you heard Director Velez's um, impressive bio as a former um, chief administrative judge, <laughs> uh, you can be confident that um, there will be integrity and transparency in how this commission operates. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, I, uh, how, do, how many individuals would be eligible for release under the commission based on the requirements that are outlined in the correctional law? You know, that, that's, that's a tricky thing because the, the, what you would call the average daily population of sentenced individuals at Rikers will change, you know, daily, basically. Um, and there's a, a number of, um, of uh, convictions that are excluded from eligibility. So when you whittle everything down, at least the data we looked at, which is a little old now, it's about, on any given time, about 100 individuals would be eligible. Um, and then they have to satisfy the time frame. So it doesn't mean also that all 100 would be eligible at the same time, you know, because they have to be able to have served um, a certain amount of their sentence. Their sentences have to have been more than uh, 120 days or more. And so, you know, but we're, we're lo probably looking at a couple hundred a year. 100 a year, but are you a saying- A couple hundred a year, eligible, eligible. And, and what I'm confused about is you're saying there's 100 eligible, but then they still have to meet. Correct. Other, but isn't the word eligible cover that? Like, who are the individuals? No, eligible. The, the first cut el at eligibility is the, the sentencing, the, the convictions, and the time. That oh, I see exactly. And then after that, then you have to look at a variety of compositions, which the commission will have the criteria, right, beyond that. Um, because you know when you're making these decisions, um, eligibility doesn't guarantee suitability. You know, there's the eligibility. No, I, I think we're talking about eligibility. How many individuals suitability or 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 uh, the work of the commission is a different story. I'm asking how many individuals would meet the criteria for release based on what's statutorily defined. Yeah. So eligibility for eligibility, um, you know, it's about a hundred people on any given time. And over the course of a year, we probably would see another hundred at least. So, okay. And then maybe one of my last questions here is: um, Is there a? I don't believe it's, there's a statutory defined 
process here, but is there a sort of expectation about how often the commission would convene and, or, or meet or make determinations or what that process would be? Well, I mean, it, some of it that is is dictated by the candidate pool because you know, as people when people apply, there's a time frame. You have to give a decision. I, th I believe within 30 days of the application, and then you know, so, so on and so forth. So, you know, it it'll be certainly frequent enough that we can keep up with that. It can keep up with the um, volume that's available. Right. And what we can say, it's it's sort of a, a hybrid. When you think about the fact that individuals who are sentenced to 120 days or more, and they have to have served at least 90 days of, of their sentence. So in terms of, for example, having the commissioners together to make decisions, when you take into consideration these timelines, um, right now, we would say probably at least bi-monthly. But on any given day, the commissioners, the members of the commission individually will be reviewing applications. Yeah. Okay. Um, look, I, we have a lot of work to do here. I think it's clear to, to um, um, appreciate uh, uh, now, you know, having uh, uh, the beginning process here, but we are, a year and a half after the council's on the side uh, passed the bill, the mayor uh, it's not he signed it, but it, the mayor let the look at the law, which is you know our belief that he supports it, and we're sitting here in October uh, of 2021, nearly 16 months later, without uh, uh, a lot of information about the process without seem, seemingly a lot of vetting that needs to still occur and I need to occur, let alone getting this the convening. And we're in the middle of a crisis right now that of course includes evaluating people to be safe, to see who can be sent home and can be kept safe from numerous crises that are happening inside of our city jails right now. And whether I, I've said this, whether you, whatever your feelings are, um, criminal justice and reform and, and so forth, anybody's walked in those facilities Republicans, Democrats, you name it, have seen these conditions and have been horrified by them. So I, I recognize there's other offices here and the mayor's office has to play a role in here, but I don't think any of us feel like, I, I don't, I'll somebody says, I don't feel like, uh, I, well, I feel like this needs to be, we need to add a level of urgency to, to get into this process. And if it means coming to the council, looking for candidates for it, or you know, making a larger effort here, we are happy to support that. But I think it's important, and it may the number one hundred out of six thousand may seem small to folks, but there are people's lives right. so small. Right. When you talk about you know their ability to go to somewhere and get a determination, they can go home if the commission determines that. So uh, I, I'm just I, I'm not I'm not to put Amy said you. I'm Amy said the larger issue. I'm just disappointed we didn't have an opportunity. So we're not I'm disappointed. We're not we're not we're not it's not up and running. And it's and there's a level of urgency to that now. I'm certainly, um, you know, disappointed that we're not, um, you know, we're not getting enough information here today. And I just will add one thing: is we're transferring 200 and so individuals to upstate facilities right now to help do a staffing issue. You have 100, you know, based on the numbers we're talking about, that at least could be evaluated to also look at how to address those other issues, COVID and staffing. So I, I, I just hope next week or, or imminently we can get more information on where it is. The council will help assist you with it. It's our law we passed. We recognize our role in it. But I just think it's, we're just, we're, we're, we're far too slow and late in this process right now. I wish also we just had more, frankly, information here today. Um, but thank you for your work, and I'm not naming this all at, at you, but I, I know there's other uh, folks here as well, but obviously this hearing was scheduled and meant to be an, an inflection point on where we are on one way to help to address the crisis inside of uh, these jails right now, which have been well documented. Um, I am just going to do one more check to see if we have any more questions from members. I don't see anybody's. Hands up, so I think we can go on to the next uh, panel for the think of the public panels. 
Thank you for being here, Commissioner and the General Counsel and the new Executive Director. We look forward to working with you, but I think we should talk very soon about ways that we can make sure your work gets started. And, uh, and I, uh, uh, I look forward to doing that. So thank you. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. We will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and will also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would like to now welcome Zachary Katz Nelson to testify, followed by Rachel Snyderman, followed by Kondra Clark. Time starts now. Mr. Katz Nelson, you're still on uh, mute. Could you please accept the unmute? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Zachary Katz Nelson. I'm the executive director of the Whitman Commission, and thanks so much for inviting me to testify and for holding this hearing today. As the chair has said, you know, this is an emergency situation and every individual at Rikers matters and every person that we can get out of that hellacious situation right now matters. Uh, and obviously we wanna do it safely, but we need to do it as swiftly as possible. And so the commission can play a real role here. And we're talking about roughly hundred people eligible now, hundreds of people over the course of a year that matters. Uh, it matters tremendously. And I just wanted to mention a few statistics because these are people who are city sentenced, right? They've been sentenced some period of time in the jails. If you look at actually recidiv recidivism rates for people who are sentenced to short-term jail sentences at Rikers, like these folks who would be eligible, they actually have a 10% greater recidivism rate than people who are facing the same charges in New York City and were given alternatives. And so we know that Rikers actually hurts us, not just on an individual basis and the people what they're exposed to, but as a community, it hurts us in terms of public safety. And so we really have a chance to address that. And when we add on the prospect of providing people with housing and services and probation obviously does a really strong job in many ways in getting people on the right path, we see that it makes a huge difference in people's lives. So the 6A program, when we had over 300 people released to that program with housing and with services, we saw actually a 57% reduction in rearrests in the first six months of that program. That's a stunning number. It just shows that these are people who, yes, they have been convicted of something, but we can really find a better path forward. And I would just wanna say it also honors crime victims. There was a survey released earlier this year of the views of victims of violent crime and 80% of the people surveyed support programs just like this, where we can get people out and connect yeah. them with services. It matters tremendously on so many levels. We really hope the mayor will move as soon as absolutely possible to appoint people to the commission. Thanks so much. Thank you. Just one quick question for you. Um, uh, I think one of the issues being identified here is, is vetting individuals and identifying individuals. In your experience, do you feel there are uh, uh, eligible, you, you work in the criminal justice field, do you uh, uh, or see that as a challenge or do you believe that the criteria allows individuals to, to be able to serve on it? I mean, I think one of the issues we've heard is that, uh, that the, uh, uh, it's been you know, a challenge to try to identify and find individuals. In your experience, you wanna to speak to that or whether the criteria is, and, and whether you are aware of folks that are, uh, meet that criteria and willing to serve on the commission? Yeah, I, I don't see why in a city as, as vast as New York City and with the number of people that are, have educational background qualifications that are necessary for the commission, that we should easily be able to find people who can serve. Uh, there, there are lots of people that, that I think would be willing and be interested in trying to help individuals and help the city move forward. Yeah, and um, we certainly would you know, seek, seek some of those out those folks, and I think certainly the Department of Probation and the Mayor's Office need those as well. So would welcome any suggestions you may have when it comes to uh, uh, people that can serve on that. And, and I, I agree with your uh, sentiment expressed in the testimony as well. Thank you, nice to see you. Sure, nice to see you too, thank you. And we'd be happy to tell forward a list of some folks that we think might be good candidates. That'd be great, thank you. Thank you, next we'll hear from Rachel Snyderman, followed by Condra Clark, followed by Scott Peltrowitz. 
Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Rachel Schneiderman, and I'm a correction specialist at New York County Defender Services. Thank you to the Committee on Criminal Justice and Chair Powers for holding this hearing. Um, I do have to say I'm a bit horrified by the lack of urgency um, in establishing this commission, but I'm going to share a story of one of our clients who would be eligible for release if this um, commission was established. Um, so the first thing Mo said to me when I asked him about the possibility of release was that jail is not helping him. He said, I've been here so many times and they don't have the tools to help me. Mo is a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. He's an endless feed feedback loop, stealing to get money to buy drugs, getting sent to jail for stealing, being spit back out in society with no resources to help with his houselessness, his addiction, his depression. It's no wonder that he returns to what he knows, friends who are bad influences and his vices. Mo is currently serving two sentences for misdemeanor convictions of pettit larceny, neither of which stem from a domestic violence incident. He entered custody on the 17th of September and has now served longer than 30 days. He is eligible to be considered for local conditional release. All Mo wants is a fresh start. He has a daughter and three grandchildren. He wants to be a role model for a 16 year old grandson to let him know what he has been through and guide him down a better path. He knows he's getting older and it weighs on him. He said to me, the lifespan of a black man is 56 to 71 years old. I'm in there. I don't have much more time. The thought is sobering. He wants to share love and support with his family while he still can. Mo has been through NA and AA programs before and it was successful for him. He remained sober for five years. Unfortunately, there are no NA or AA programs in jail and he has not historically been set up with the tools he needs to change his life. He keeps returning to what he knows. He told me over and over again, that's not the life he wants. He suffers from substance use disorder. He steals for that reason and that reason alone. If Mo were released, our office could set him up with the support and resources he needs for success. He's introspective enough to know that he needs support. He is a family who can help him in his journey to recovery, uh -huh. but he needs more. Unless the local conditional release commission is assembled and begins hearing applications, Mo will spend the next six months languishing on Rikers Island. Moving forward the, with the commission would help Mo and countless other incarcerated individuals just like him, whose well-being hinges on release. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here and testifying. Next, we'll hear from Kondra Clark, followed by Scott Paltrowitz, followed by Kelly Grace Price. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Powers and uh, all the esteemed members of this committee. Um, my name is Robert O'Connor and I'm a policy intern at Exodus Transitional Community, a preventive reentry and advocacy organization with our main office locations in East Harlem. I work closely with Kendra Clark and I'm testifying on her behalf. Now, please allow me to state up front that we appreciate the opportunity to give testimony to you in regard to the local conditional release law referred to as the LCR. And let me further state at the outset that we can only hope that the LCR is the first of many steps toward a broad and bold reform to give more incarcerated people a roadmap for successful entry back to the community. What we most admire about the LCR is that it seeks to prepare individuals to virtually at the moment to, to prepare individuals for release at the moment they are imprisoned. It seeks to reintegrate rather than alienate. It focuses more on rehabilitation than punishment. However, where the LCA uh, the LCR comes up woefully short is in the framework of who it peremptorily excludes. Anyone who has an aggregate sentence of more than two years is ineligible. So we must amend this law, um, excuse me, and make it more comprehensive to include those whose sentences exceed two years. In the Harvard Political Report of August of this year, entitled Recidivism Imprisons American Progress, it unabashedly calls for a holistic approach, leaving no one out. The report clearly states that, quote, by shifting the goal of incarceration toward rehabilitation, we can work to lower the recidivism rate by investing in mental health care, devising personalized education for prisoners, and con connecting prisoners with job opportunities and valuable skills in the prison to work pop, uh, pipeline. 
let me just go to my end here. I was advised by various people in the system at the time when I was in prison about a graduate program that was um, uh, kind of unique. Um, it was there for a short time and it closed down. But and I was advised to wait until the end of my sentence to um, apply for it. Fortunately, I, I ignored what amounted to nothing more than a platitude. Education was invaluable in, in helping me cope with and to understand the many challenges I faced throughout the rest of my sentence. Arguably, individuals with long-term sentences are most in need of rehabilitative programs. So instead of totally abandoning all hope for those individuals convicted of uh, more serious crimes with lengthier, lengthy um, sentences, um, we can we can have a viable and universal LCR such as work release, educational release, and or release to treatment. This is what demonstrably works to reduce recidivism and increase successful reintegration. Reentry should start on day one of incarceration. Thank you. We've we we okay. just for time's sake we have to yeah. keep going, but appreciate it. And we then agree with a lot of what you're saying. Thanks so much. Thanks okay. for being here. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Scott Paltrowitz, followed by Kelly Grace Price. Time starts now. I think he just needs to be unmuted. New Yorker, sensible death. Scott, you're, uh, you're, I think you're muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Your uh, signal is not great from where I am. Scott, you're coming in very choppy. I think you may have to uh, move it to a different location or try to come back on. Why don't we go to the next uh, panelist and then we'll come back and uh, give Scott an opportunity to testify. Next, we'll hear from Kelly Grace Price. Time starts now. Hi, good morning. Sorry, I'm going to keep my camera off if you don't mind. My battery is very low. I'll be quick. Um, Councilman Powers, thank you so much for chairing this very frustrating hearing. I'm just feeling so sick to my stomach knowing that we could have had 100, 150 people off the island over the last year and a half. I... <sighs> This is, I think, the third hearing I've been at this week where no one from the mayor's office has even attended. Um, we had a hearing on Monday morning in the Women's Issues Committee and the Public Safety Committee about data of sexual violence. And there was no one from the mayor's office to end gender-based violence there. There was no one from the mayor's office of um, criminal justice. Uh, I, I know it's not your fault, Chief Chair Powers, but whatever you can do to poke them. The public is noticing. What are we becoming some sort of um, behind the scenes government where government officials don't have to show up and answer to the public because they can hide behind Ms. Zooms. Um, especially right now when the mayor is planning on unconstitutionally and criminally moving people from Rosie's to Bedford. Yes, criminally, it's against the New York state corrections law to move non-sentenced -senten people into prisons. And it's such a dangerous precedent to set. This is a time where we really should be knocking on the mayor's door. I've said enough. I'm tired of the sound of my voice. I'll submit my written testimony, which will be more detailed about the needs of women on Rosie's for this specific commission. Thank you so much for all your work. And Anne uh, Bermudez, uh, I met you with my boxer, Frank Sinatra, a couple years ago. I think um, you might remember me, but it's nice to hear from you. And I hope we can establish our connection again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here, as always. Uh, and let's try to see if we can go back to Scott Pal Paltrowitz. Uh, just see if we have a 
signal now. Can you, can you all hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Powers, Council Member Rivera, and other council members for holding this hearing. You know, it's hard to even be here within just the last week. We've lost Victor Mercado and Anthony Scott. I don't know if you all have read the Board of Corrections report about Nicholas Feliciano, but you ha if you haven't read it, please read every word. It is an indictment of this entire system. It's really outrageous and disgusting. The abuse after abuse after abuse that Nicholas endured before finally he tried to hang himself and for basically eight minutes was left hanging while officers, sergeants, other staff, medical staff watched him and did nothing to prevent, you know, the harm that happened to him and he's now left brain damaged. You know, 14 New Yorkers have died preventable deaths this year, all caused by the city's jails. And each of those people should be alive today, but for the policies and practices of state and local officials. So everything has to be done to alleviate this and to decarcerate. And this commission is one piece and it should have been up and running so long ago. And it must immediately move forward and start reviewing and releasing people now. People who are currently in these death traps that are the city jails and people who are serving city sentences, but have already been sent to other health holes that are state prison should be released immediately. I also will reemphasize what some of the council members have emphasized that at least a majority of the appointees should be people who have lived through incarceration or had or lost loved ones to incarcerations. I also have to say that much more has to be done beyond the commission. DAs and judges must stop sending people to the city jails and must act to release people who are being held pretrial immediately. This council must act immediately to end solitary confinement. Just in August, Brandon Rodriguez was locked in solitary in a shower and he is now gone. It's just outrageous that the council hasn't acted yet to end solitary. The governor and the mayor need to do more to coordinate efforts to decarcerate. Um, this is a crisis of unprecedented levels in a jail system that is always in crisis, but action needs to be taken now to, to decarcerate and save lives. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. This concludes public testimony. If we had inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function now and we will try to hear from you. Seeing no hands, I will turn it over to Chair Powers to close the hearing. No, thank you and thank you everybody who is here to testify today and recognize the importance of uh, having a mechanism here to look at individuals uh, during a crisis moment. And I, well, I'm grateful for the team from the Department of Probations for being here and their work. And Councilor Holden and others said the NEON program and everything else they're doing here in the city. I think we have uh, uh, asked for, by passing a law here for them and this administration to move forward. And we, uh, I am obviously very disappointed we didn't have much information today, especially at a moment where it feels like everybody should be working together to address the crisis that's happening in our jail. So we will be without question following up uh, in the coming days with the administration, Department of Probation to find out uh, exactly where they're at to get more information and to obviously urge them to move and move quickly. And uh, uh, appreciate everyone for being here to also echo that sentiment as well. Uh, it is, as you might imagine, as others have said, uh, having hearings where we don't get information that is needed, desired to do our jobs is incredibly frustrating. So uh, with that, I'm going to close the hearing out. We will be taking our next steps to follow up here. And I want to thank all my colleagues who are here today and ask questions and uh, everyone else for being here as well. And with that being said, uh, this meeting 